by Rio Grande. Tulsa City Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 174. Investigate an explosion and fire at 753 Overland Avenue. That's all. Sees it, makes one desperate lunge. Bare hands outstretched as though to smother it. 
But as his fear crazed eyes watch, the flame reaches its destination. Lingers a brief split second. Then... <laughs> Residents for miles around, hearing the ground-shaking explosion rush from their homes, find the sky tinged with red as huge flames shoot hundreds of feet into the air above all the remains of the old barn. And in the fire station, an alarm bell informs fire chief Frank Wilson of the explosion. Galvanizes a sudden action every available piece of fire equipment. Responding also to the alarm is Captain of Detective R.F. Lynch. Accompanied by several officers from the Culver City Police Department. They are negative, Chief. There is still explosion, Lou. Less than hundreds of gallons of alcohol in there, stored in tanks. No plenty left. I hear someone screaming in there, officer. Just after the explosion. I will hit it. Sure, that's Yeah, yeah, I know there was someone screaming. There couldn't be any mistake about it. It was awful. Not much chance of anybody being alive inside that furnace. Well, looks like a clear space there. The fire hasn't reached yet. Might get in if we hurry. Come on, let's go. Right. That tank is burning. Well, it looks like a man, all right. Burned or split. This burning tank of alcohol is going to let go in a minute and spill all over him. Come on. We've got to get him. You can't do it, Lynch. That place is all set for blow. If we don't get that fellow out of there now, how am I supposed to know who he was? That alcohol will demolish him. Come on. One of you grab that rope there and we'll see if we can drag him out. I got it. That tank starts spilling. Somebody yell and loud. They're taking a big chance, Lynch. Yeah, come on. around his feet, and we can drag him from a safer distance. It's getting too hot, Lynch. Yeah. Yeah. Now let's get out of here. Come on. Hurry. Yeah. This is all right. Now give me a hand with this rope. Yes. Hey, hurry up, Lynch. That tank's coming down. Yeah, I see it. Ah. There he is. Okay. Now if we can carry him outside, we'll see what we got. Practically nothing, uh. you ask me. You'll never get an identification of this one. Save your breath, Ed. Give me a hand here. Easy. There. Now, come on. Let's get out of here before the whole place falls down. Struggling under the weight of the burned man, Lynch and his companion managed to reach the open air as the entire section of barn they were just in collapses into a shambles of burning wood. And once clear, a flashlight reveals the body to be so badly burned that there is apparently no single clue as to its identity. I told you we were wasting our time in there. How are you going to find out who this fellow was when there's nothing left of him? Well, frankly, I don't know. Hold that flash here while I look him over. Okay. Yeah. No chance of anybody recognizing him by his face, that's certain. Uh, no clothing left. Hey, bring that flash down here a little closer, will you? Uh, yeah, that's got it. What's up? Huh. Looks like a tattoo mark here on the back of his arm. You see here where well, it isn't burnt? Here, what does it say? Manila. T I nineteen nineteen. That's a great hat. That isn't nothing at all. Maybe. Hello, Lynch. What's going on here? Oh, hello, Cecil. A little stir blew up. Made ashes out of this bird. Yeah? I just got in on the train in time to hear the excitement. Go about here as fast as I could. Well, I've been trying to get an identification on him, but so far, the only thing I've got is this tattoo mark. Manila P.I. 1919. Probably an ex-sailor, a soldier. Well, what's the reason for wanting an identification so badly? Mainly the fact that I'd like to get a line on the bunch who ran this deal. I've been trying to find it for months. Now that I have, the only person who might be able to tell me anything is Quinto Chris. Well, you might as well call the wagon and take him into the morgue. Not much we can do out here to let fires over. Yeah. Wilson doesn't get it under control soon. There's not going to be enough left of it to bother looking through. Oh, well, come on. Let's phone for the wagon. I'm getting tired of this noise. For several hours, Chief Wilson directs his department in an attempt to extinguish the alcohol fed blaze. And finally, as the first rays of the morning sun announce a new day, the last flame gives way in its stubborn battle and subsides into a smoldering ruin. And at the morgue, Captain Lynch and Captain Cecil Crusell, head of the motorcycle division, mull over the burned body, and make another vain attempt to find some bit of identification. Yeah, this spot on his back looks as though there'd been more tattooing, Lynch. Yeah, but what does it say? That I couldn't tell you. That's the trouble. That and the one bit of tattooing on his arm, which does us practically no good, have absolutely nothing to go on. 
How about fingerprints? wonder if we could get anything there. And those fingers? <laughs> Not a chance. Nothing left to print with. Well, looks kind of hopeless. Listen, Cecil, I've got an idea. How about us calling up Sheriff Bissell in Los Angeles and seeing if he can help us? They've got a lot of new fingerprints and identification equipment on there. Might have something new. Hmm, can't hurt any. You think we'll stop cold at this end? That's just what I'm going to do. Give me that phone. <laughs> In response to Lynch's call, Captain Nuremberg of the Identification Bureau drives to Tull of the City, pulls up in front of the morgue, and once inside, he meets Lynch in two cells. Ah, not much to go on, is there? Not much. Now, let me see these fingers. Mm-hmm. No chance of a print. Yeah, that's what we figured. There's one small chance, though, that we can try. Something I've never done before. Mm-hmm. What's that? Attempt to restore the skin of the fingers to normal by soaking them in alcohol and powdering them. Think it might work? I can't say definitely. I know that it's just possible. But it will be experimental completely. Well, for me, I say let's try it. If it works, we're ahead. If it doesn't, what are we lost? Accordingly, with all arrangements made, Nuremberg returns to the laboratory to make preparations for the experiment. While the trial, accompanied by police, Judge Randall drives to the burn track, begins an investigation. Well, looks like this is where someone lives. Yeah, that old iron bed there. Probably a sort of general hangout living quarters for that poor fellow that got burned and the rest of the gang. What's all this junk over here? I don't know. Looks like what is left is a chest of drawers or something. Well, the only thing that didn't burn. Yeah. Uh, you think you'll get anywhere with that fingerprint idea, Cecil? Oh, I don't know, Judge. There's a chance. Nick is pretty enthusiastic over it. Uh, more power to him. Without the slimmest lead I've ever heard of. Hello, what's this? You find something? I don't know. Looks like an old wallet. Yeah, what it is. Mm. Anything in it? Oh, some papers. Let me see. Hmm. There's an old speed ticket. Only wait a minute. It's not so old. Made out on December 8th. Yeah. Well, that's day before yesterday. Yeah. Let's see if I can make out the name on it. Harry A. H. O. Howard. Harry A. Howard. Well, you remember that name, don't you, Judge? Yeah. Hey, wasn't he the fellow we had up for bootlegging a couple of times? Right. Lynch and I have been trying to connect him with some big time skill for a long time. And it looks like we were right. Hmm, let's see what we got here. Nearby orders to appear in Yeah, and here's the officer's name who gave it. Say, I've got an idea that this little ticket is going to make a lot of difference in this case, Judge. <laughs> Angeles traffic officer proves conclusively that the Howard on the traffic ticket and the Howard to tell knows are one and the same man. With this knowledge, to tell hurries back to Tulsa City and informs Lynch his discovery. Then the two officers settle down to await the arrival of Nuremberg and the start of their identification experiment. And at ten the next morning, after a ceaseless night, they greet the fingerprint expert and hurry to the morgue. How are you going about this thing, Nuremberg? Well, the first thing we've got to do is strip the skin from the fingertips. And we've got to be careful doing it, too. That's the first place we can go wrong. What do we do with it when we get it? Soak it in alcohol for three days. That should restore it to a fair degree of normality, at least enough to party. Then, if everything goes well, we photograph the results and get a set of fingerprints. Of course, the odds are that we won't get anything, but there's that one chance. I've got a hunch it'll work, Nuremberg. A strong hunch. And so far, my hunches have been 100% right. Come on, let's get started. So, throughout the morning, Nuremberg works like some skilled surgeon, carefully removing the tarred skin from the teeth's fingertips, delicately placing them in a container of alcohol to soak. It is a nerve-stretching task, and when, toward the afternoon, Edward straightens up from his work, pronounces the first step of the experiment finished, both to tell and Lynch give a long, suppressed sigh of relief. So far, so good. And now, with three long days to wait, Lynch and Tuchel pick up the former thread of evidence. Start a man hunt for the man behind the still, Harry A. Howard. But first, they make another search of the burned still. Discovered a metal waste paper container buried under a pile of tarred embers. In it, they find several scraps of torn paper. That's only one of some love letters or something. Yeah, only these scraps aren't left. 
Look more like receipt. Look more like receipt. Look more like receipt. Look more like receipt. We're on the right track. Now all we've got to do is to find Howard and pin it on him. He won't have a leg to stand. <laughs> Finding the ex-bootlegger, Harry Howard, isn't as easy as it seems. For two days, the men track down all his known haunts to find the same answer. Howard has not been seen for some time. Several friends of his are brought in, questioned, but each one denies any knowledge of Howard's whereabouts. And by the morning of the third day, Lynch and Tuchel begin to realize that things are not just what they might be. And now the search for Howard is put aside for the continuation of Durenberg's experiment. In his laboratory in Los Angeles, Lynn can to tell what anxiously as the scientist begins the second step, that of powdering the now thoroughly soaked fingertips. You see here how the skin has turned white, resumed its appearance of human skin rather than parchment. Yeah, you can tell what it is, all right. Now, the next thing is to make the tiny indentations or lines stand out. You see, unlike the usual method of fingerprinting, that is, rolling the fingers in ink and then getting an impression from pressure on a pad, We've got to photograph these tiny pieces. Naturally, the way they are, there's no contrast. Everything looks white. So we take this dark powder preparation, so, and dust it into the crevices. Then we blow off the excerpt. And there you see a perfect fingertip. By George Nuremberg, you've got something there. I hope so. Well, what now? Photograph? That's right. This lens is specially constructed to take sharp close-up pictures of small objects. Now, I'm going to set this glove-like fingertip on the end of this pencil. So, and set it up here with this light on it. Like this. You mean you're going to have to set each one up like that and take a picture? That's right. Slow, but if it works, sure. <laughs> Space of time that seems endless, the fate of Nuremberg photographs each with the five tips of one hand, repeat with the five from the other. And at last, after two hours of careful work, the place are sent to be developed and printed. Impatient for the results, Lynch and Truchel go with them. Watch quietly as the negatives are developed. Wait eagerly as the first carbon print begins to trace a pattern on the white sheet of photographic tape. Let's see, so. There's something coming up. Yeah, a tiny little circular line. Fingerprint. Why, it's almost unbelievable, then, that anyone could start with what Nuremberg had and finish with this. A perfect set of prints. Now that we've got them, they might be useless. That's right. Only somehow I have a feeling... Yeah. So right. Well, there you are, Lieutenant. A perfect set. Clean as a whistle. How long do we have to wait now? Well, about five minutes, just till they get a hypo bath to fix them. Then they're all yours. Perfect. Only if you could make that four minutes, I'd appreciate it. My nerves are at the point now with one extra minute, and I think they'll bust. <laughs> okay, Lieutenant. I'll see what I can do. Can't have any busted nerves lying around here. No room for them in a dark room. <laughs> <laughs> and in the allotted time, Lynch and Truchell find themselves in possession of the long-awaited print. Immediately, they start the first move towards an identification, that of checking with the files in the Los Angeles Sheriff's Fingerprint Bureau. Also, a copy of the print with a description of the tattoo marks found on the dead man's arm is sent to the War Department with a request for information regarding fame. And in a short time, their search for the files comes to an abrupt end as a card bearing the name James C. Duane. An identical spent set of fingerprints comes to light. Every classification is identical. Under the name, there is a line which reads, Held for San Francisco Police in connection with diamond theft. Obviously, the dead man is no other than one James C. Duane, ex Diamond Thief. Then, two days later, word comes from the War Department via teletype. Regarding your uh, request for information, fingerprints and general description that of one Dennis James Curtis, enlisted in the United States Navy from San Francisco. April 16th, 1919. Discharged May 1920 for banned conduct. Home address given as 3420 San Jose Avenue, Alameda, California. Respectfully, George Air Holmes, Commander in Charge of Naval Personnel, Washington, D.C. And 
in response to a telegram, Duane, alias Curtis's father, makes the trip down from Alameda, identifies his son's remains, and puts an end once and for all to all speculations as to his identity. And Lynch and Truchel begin a minute search for the missing Howard. But this time as before, their efforts are blocked at every turn. No one knows where Howard is. No one knows anything about his connection with the burned still. No one apparently knows anything, and at last, after two months of constant seeking, the officers conclude that their man has left town for good. Relax in their search. Then one day, Lynch receives a call from a constable he knows, a call asking his assistance in staking out a house in the West Adams district in order to catch a man wanted on a theft charge. Accordingly, Lynch drives over, meets the constable. Casually, he looks over the arrest warrant, then suddenly stiffens to attention. Hey, is this the fellow you're going after? Yeah, why? Harry Albert. Harry Howard's brother-in-law. Yeah, who's Harry Howard? A gent Trushell and I have been looking for for months. He's the lad behind one of the biggest steel outfits in town. I've got a warrant for his arrest right in my pocket. Been carrying it there just in case I happen to run into him some time. Hey, what's this Albert's got to do with him? He's mixed up with him and a couple of bootlegging rats we nabbed hired on. Claims to be his brother-in-law. Nice family. Albert's is one for all of us in Los Angeles. Yeah, well, let's get back to this house. I'd like to give it the one so and see if I can get a lead as to where Howard is. That's one person I'm anxious to get my hands on. Uh, probably won't find anything. People like this aren't apt to leave their calling cards lying around. However, I still want Albert, so let's go. <laughs> Once at the house, Constable Jennings and Lynch, finding no one home, make a quick search. Find in a drawer in the bedroom something that pleases Lynch immensely. This has got it. Just the thing I've been looking for. Oh, what's that? This letter here from Harry Howard with a return address in Ontario, California. <laughs> and I thought he was smart. Come on, Jennings. We're going to take a fast tour to Ontario. What, now? You bet your life now. I'm not wasting any time. Two months I've spent looking in every alley, hot shop, pool hole, and bootlegging joint. And now it looks as though maybe I found him. Come on, next stop, Ontario. Not wanting to waste the time necessary to return to Culver City and locate Trussell, Lynch and his companion, Constable Jennings, start a mad drive to the foothill town of Ontario. Mile after mile, they drive at breakneck speed, and inside of 30 minutes, they pull to a grinding stop in front of the Ontario police station. A brief stop there, long enough to enlist the aid of a local officer... And they resumed the journey. This time, stopping down the street from a small white house, bearing the address found on the letter. Quietly, Lynch makes the plan. Issues instruction. Now, there's no way of telling how many we're going to find in there. But the way I've got to figure it, if we surprise them, we'll have a good chance of grabbing them before they know what's happened. Well, it sounds logical enough. Jennings, suppose you take the west side of the house. Right. You the back door. I'll go in the front way. All right. And you hear me inside? You come in through the back door fast. They start out first, nail them. Don't let anyone get away until we know who we have. Understand? Perfect. Okay, and be careful. I don't know much about this, Harry lad. I understand he carries a gun, and he isn't particular who he uses it on. Keep that in mind. Yeah, don't worry. I'm not anxious to get filled with lead. Okay, then. Let's go. Slowly, quietly, the three men approach the little white house. Wordlessly, Jennings takes his position at the side under the windows. The Ontario officer at the back door. Then, with all in readiness, Lynch eases up the front steps onto the porch. Quietly tries the door, finds it locked. A moment's hesitation. Then, his mind made up, Lieutenant Lynch goes into 215 pound action. Peter, Harry, come on. There we are. All of it. The house is around here. Take two couple. Round up these people, Jenny. I'm going after Howard. All right, all right, all of you. Keep away from those shotguns or you get hurt. Come on, you can go ahead. Talk. 
And I'll tell you some things that'll surprise you, too. Things that'll surprise you plenty. And hey, Howard, get talk. All the way back to Culver City, where he was lodged in jail on charges of operating a still. But when he finished, the only thing he had done was to put himself behind bars for some time to come. Thus, through the combination of the elements of chance, patience, and science, what might have turned out to be an unsolved case ended with the criminal in jail and our records marked solved. Thank you, Lieutenant Lynn. Rio Grande Crack is known as the gasoline of police car performance in the emergency equipment of the second largest county in the United States, Coconina County, Arizona. The largest city in the West, Los Angeles. Oakland, Berkeley, Marysville, Fresno, Santa Barbara, Pasadena, Monterey Park, San Diego, Santa Barbara County, Orange County, San Diego County, Las Vegas, Nevada, Phoenix, Arizona, Maricopa County, Arizona, and many, many other cities and counties. Wherever you buy Rio Grande cracked gasoline, you can buy Sinclair motor oil. Refined from the highest price and oldest Pennsylvania and mid-continent crude oil. They're de-waxed, de-jellied, super-refined, and made available to you at all Rio Grande stations in tamper-proof cans. Whenever you buy Rio Grande cracked gasoline, get your copy of Calling All Cars News. You'll enjoy the featured article, Pictures of Wanted Criminals, with rewards up to $10,000. Get police car performance with Rio Grande Crack gasoline and Sinclair motor oils at your independent Rio Grande dealer tomorrow.